turning, turning into targeting terms and resell those targeting terms in the middle of the ecosystem undercutting publisher pricing right and this is i'm just using this as an example because it's one i happen to be particularly familiar with and like is this potentially fair use i don't know is it a copyright or a plagiarism issue i don't know about that either but i do think that at the very least we should be able to think about how providers of data are undercut by it somebody said something recently where they were like if if it goes on long enough you end up destroying all the people whose job it is to write things their jobs are gone and then the future chat gpt has murdered has, has been murdered by the past chat gpt because there is no longer anything new for it to be trained on except other maybe well written maybe bullshit chat gpt output right um and so i think it's worth as we look at how to use these things and how to consider using these things how people who are providing the inputs can have controls over whether they do or not, and um, how these things might be modeled in order to provide some stake to participants. And I, I'm not interested in cryptocurrency, so let's not go down that road. <laughs> um, but like, there sh it, if my data is being used in this, there should be something more to it than just it gets mashed all up into the system, which can then say, you know, it's summarizing me, but not writing something very good in that summary, um, but can use that data for other things that might be quite useful. I think like it is fascinating too, because in some ways the, the flip side of that is the authorship becomes good enough to be dangerous. Um, where like, I asked ChatGPT for a bio of myself, and it has four very subtle errors in it. And I publish a lot about myself. Um, I, I, I put a lot of stuff on the internet. There's a lot of source information here. And there is enough information that it could write something that looks a lot like my bio, but has these very subtle problems. And then that itself causes the issue of like, I can ask for it, if it knows a particular author and it knows that author and I can ask it to write something in the style of that author and it writes something, but it's not in the style of that author, but like how that moves forward and how that interacts with the author's work on the wider web becomes sort of very difficult to parse out moving forward. The, the problems I think are ones of compensation, right? There's a really great, did I, did I link this last time? The, jet, the video by um, a person named Jack Saint. I might have linked it already, but um, I'll pull it up again. Uh, but like the the point is like, is it bad that what's, AI? What's can... the problem with AI arc? You did. Yeah, yeah, that's the one, right? Yeah. The, the the thing is like, is making art fundamentally something that should be more accessible to everyone? Yeah, probably. It would be great if we could do this. But the the um, the larger problem is that if this starts being used to make it so that artists can't make money, like I, I don't really care about the ontological consequences of soullessness in in AI art. Um, I do care about the fact that you know my friend can't get a job and therefore can't pay rent and therefore can't eat, right? So it's talking about the conditions by which we flip the switch on socialism, right? I think as we support these types of processes, we should be thinking about how do we support accompanying systems that don't cause them to destroy the world. Not by describing it in the style of a sci-fi author, but by being agents used by capitalists in a capitalist system. Um, which is, I think, much more likely to destroy the world than anything it could come up with if you ask it to be a sci-fi author. Um, not that I think it's particularly likely to destroy the world, but it, I think that's more likely to cause problems than anything else. So this is linked nicely to your question about can capitalism <clears throat> be tipped over? Um, and you just 
reference socialism too. And I'm reminded um, something I need to fact check, but apparently in the early reggae world, um, uh, artists would publish 45s with a B-side that was the same song minus their lyrics because they were hoping that somebody else in the community would sample their their instrumentals and include them, which was homage, which was basically a, a thing you wanted. It was sort of tribute and reference that your music made it up through the family tree of reggae songs. Um, so you would be offering up, like the Grateful Dead let people record their concerts, but you were offering up your, your just your instrumentals for that purpose. And it would be nice if people who wanted to be artists could make a living in some new and fashionable way uh, while contributing their work to the commons not afraid of being emulated but in fact proud of having something that they, some signature that they've created being riffed on reference remixed and becoming part of the patrimony that's uh great i mean they, they know that uh, anecdote that's very fascinating uh jerry thank you i'll look for it i guess here i i i keep in the back of my mind this all the conversation is very interesting i keep going back to like what can we do? Is there like a high leverage point here and so on? And it seems like, you know, in particular as, acceler as acceleration is ongoing like, or we feel it, it seems likely that there is. And to me, it's like, I, I'm going back to what Aaron said about like, you know, when do we hit stop or like uh, and switch to capital to away from capitalism or, you know, that's a coordination problem to some extent. And maybe like, you know, again, like building the tools or even like the frameworks or the words, the you know, vocabulary to enable people affected by this um, like upcoming likely wave of disruption within capitalism uh, could be a good target right we could prepare for that and say like okay what can we do which tools can we develop so that when that hits people they know what to do instead of like all of us just like sort of like uh you know running around i guess or like a, in a discordant way or whatever the scene is so uh, i guess i go back to the commons always pretty much by default you know, like you could imagine, and I, I go back this, uh, you know, to, to the idea of like, uh, you know, how these uh, these models are, uh, you know, trained and fine tuned and so on, and whether like people pulling together, or just being able to say, you know, whatever I produce online from this moment of time onwards, is covered by such a license, or is you know is meant to be used uh, only by uh, the commons in, of which I'm part of. I, you can imagine a, a protocol in which you can say, by default, everything I produce is in such and such commons. It can be, you know, like one name. Uh, and all the people that, you know, choose the same one are in the same, uh, like, vault to some extent. Generative commons agreement sounds great, and I don't know about it. So, yes, uh, two hands, I yield. <laughs> um, to go along with um, Jerry's uh, reggae, uh, anecdote i um japanese anime is also another place where uh I, so i just looked it up and found a a, a semi-source um the it's it's illegal to make fan uh, you know indie indie stuff of a commercial you know product um so you're not supposed to but um but people but uh, the ip owners look the other way uh, so people make fan art uh, it's kind of like the Grateful Dead thing, you know. It's like as long as we're we're as long as you're not making a big commercial profit out of it, you know, go ahead. It's free promotion. Um, and then uh, the they make the point that this person makes the point that some fan art actually gets successful enough to become um, become the uh, the real stuff, you know. They um, uh, they they wouldn't fork the original ip but based on the work that they did they got enough of a following that they can do their own art as uh you know as pro instead of being like indie stuff <laughs> uh, all right i love, love tv open. tropes yeah uh yeah tv tropes is cool um so I just put in the generative commons agreement because we had a series of conversations in the middle of the pandemic as part of OGM that didn't lead to an agreement we could sort of all point to and, and agree with, but it was a really nice series of calls provoked partly because one of our members, uh, Michael Grossman, 
uh, had a company and he was he was participating in OGM um, and offering a lot of like comments, value, et cetera. He was like happily in there, but he was trying to figure out how to make his platform work better. And so he had a commercial aim as part of his participation. And he asked, well, so what are the ground rules here? Like what happens if we come up with ideas? What happens to, you know, things that I contribute, whatever else. So we were trying to create some sort of agreement that you could put, you know, put a stamp on your avatar or something else that said, hey, when I'm participating, I participate, it's sort of like Chatham House rules. Like if it were successful, it would be like Chatham House rules. Be like, when I'm participating, here's my assumptions about my ideas. And and the generative commons agreement, which might be one of several flavors, one of them could be the I own everything agreement and don't talk to me unless you pay me agreement. But the generative commons agreement was meant to uh, stimulate people to contribute to the commons with the knowledge that they would like to make a living somehow possibly as well and to find some of you know some of that balance and uh, again we never finished writing the agreement but there's a bunch of calls i can point anybody to uh that are on youtube that because i uploaded all those calls uh back when uh, go ahead Aaron. Uh, yeah um i was just gonna say i think like that is conceptually pretty interesting. Uh, I'd be interested to see what it could eventually come up with if you went further with it. It's it, and it's also the other piece of it is the mechanical possibility of it. I've been talking about this, which is like there are there is um, a W three C established rights like mechanical like rights language. Of course, Creative Commons has something that's functionally sort of a mechanically parsable rights language. Um, and then there's like robots.txt, which is another iteration of this. I think it, I think it's very difficult to figure out, one, what exactly we need it to do, two, exactly how you want it to work, and three, how you deal with the question of um, fair use in these things and how it works. It's very frustrating, right, because it's like, on one hand, I am very pro fair use. On the other hand, if somebody uses fair use to remix your work up in a way that undercuts you, that seems to be against the spirit um, of what's going on. Um, but how you make that distinction is not easy to say. Um, I certainly can't. Uh, and I think that's a, a space that is very interesting to think about and invest time in considering. Agreed. Um, this is a, a lovely thicket of issues. Um, yes, I mean, um, I will read more on the Genetic Commons Agreement, but like I think way before uh, Samuel left, he said like, uh maybe a shared dog for what to do i guess we already like uh well we have the shared, uh, the shared, a shared dog idea we have like the uh, uh you know massive wiki ripples and so on to discuss this kind of thing but yeah i mean it does seem like going back to the, this commons agreement that does seem to tie in very very well with i mean many of the things we discussed today and we have been discussing lately so maybe resurrecting that in, in some shape or form could be I will be up for the experiment for what it's worth. And uh, we have the domain generativecommons.org. Oh, nice. OK. Which is good. It's not, yeah, That would be a good place for something like this. And I don't know how else to host it or what else to do with it, but but it's, it's, it's a thing. Nice. And right now, there is just uh, an image of a seedling in some soil and a headline and a, a link out to some attempts. Uh, yeah, there's no there's no actual text in the agreement, but there could easily be. Nice. Um, we've gone sort of our usual call length. Shall we wrap this call? Over a little. We're not at 90 minutes, but we've gone we've gone a bunch. Sounds good, uh, yeah. Uh, before we wrap, I was wondering, um, I'm still working on like the notes parsing and combining tool. I was wondering if anyone had 
like progress on that that they'd like to report that would help me influence my design. I'm going to be a little bit slow in putting something together on this because it's, uh, things got a little crazy in work this last week and this week, but also because I decided this would be a good opportunity for me to learn Rust. So mm. uh, I'm, ve I'm very interested in it, but I, I am starting from literal zero. So it's going to be a, a little bit longer for me to set up the stuff that I want to set up for this. Mm. So Vera from uh, Flancia Collective, I mean, uh, you know, developing a hero and Agora has been doing like Rust as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we have like some plugins, I mean, parsers within Rust now. Um, oh, that's uh, cool. Could you link that? <coughs> link what? The the parsers in Rust. I'm curious. That's what yeah, yeah. was talking about. Yeah. All right. And uh, I think community rule is not there. Yep. Uh, that's what I'm referring to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are in social co-op. I, I, I went to social co-op because of him. And like, yeah, he's like. He's, really, he's very interesting. He's, he's working this. He doesn't communicate a lot, but he's, he's like working these same fields. He's uh, communicating over his work. I mean, it, just what he produces. But yeah, I know, I know. It's like, uh, yeah. I Maybe I'm just I mean. not. I'm. I'm not. I'm probably just not listening to him in the right place. Uh, he could be interested maybe on like. Uh, maybe he could drop by someday. I mean, I, I'm talking to him right now about like some projects in social co. Uh, yeah, exciting work there. Cool. 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 And yes, and Aram, um, uh, because you're dealing also with like the parsing and so on, like I'd be happy to like think, uh, you know, like 101 or like we can have like a call, maybe focus around like this, uh, some more technical aspects there. Uh, if we can, if I can help with anything, I don't know. Yeah, uh, maybe. Let me get a little bit further along since I am literally starting at zero with Rust. I think I probably need to uh, push a little bit further through before anything is at the point that feedback could make it better. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I will probably take you up on that maybe in a couple of weeks. Oh, just, just to say it, I don't know if this is impolite or not, but GPT-4 is, is a fun way to help learn a language. Yes. I so you say this, but I find that I have developers I work with who use, um, it's, it's GitHub also AI copilot. Yeah. And I find that they very often it is very easy to let it answer the question and not learn the answer. That's true too. Yes. Um, and I fear that in myself. Um, gotcha. So I have thus far avoided it. But I did, as an experiment for working with Rust, since I am starting with zero, I did buy a sub for Copilot to see what it can do for me in this respect. We'll see. I I, I haven't tried Copilot, um, but I actually really value the conversational way chat GPT and I, I for code I think you want GPT four. Um, you can how do you it. how do you yeah. access Ch GPT four over chat GPT? I haven't even gotten into that yet. Uh, you have to have the twenty dollar a month plus subscription. Um, and then you okay, just that explains it. it. And on the plus well, you, you aim it you aim at which engine you want to use because it they eat, it eats your tokens at different rates. Uh, plus does not. Oh but you have a but you have an allowance, right? No, uh, you've got a limit, which I've never bumped into, and it keeps yeah. getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> right now, it's uh, 25 messages every three hours, huh. um, cool. which actually, I you know, I wrote the Python script with GPT-4 and nine prompts, uh, even though it took me two hours. I still can't figure out how that math worked out, but um, 25 is still a, a big conversation with with the LLM. Sweet. Um, GPT-4 is super expensive over the API. Um, you know, 20, 30, 60 times <laughs> as much as 3.5. Interesting. Well, uh, I, I did note that, like, even though it's not natively conversational, Copilot does have a great response to inline comment, comments. Yeah. So you can almost have a conversation with it anyway. Yeah. I. So the the code experiment I did with GPT-4 was, you know, here write this for me. No, now add this. You know, now take that away. Change the, you know, change the endpoint. Whatever. Um, uh, I also do the same thing with human languages with GPT-4. Well, I mean, I I practice with GPT-3.5. Actually, is good enough for human languages. And the, that's like, you know, 
um, translate this? Uh, you know, why would you use this, this word rather than that word? What are the different um, different ways you conjugate? You know, give me the the thing I like most actually is uh, write a sh short story about um, dinosaurs and rabbits uh, in French, right? And um, and it, it feels different to me. I don't know if I'm strange or not. It feels different to me to be in conversation with somebody that can speak the language and I can ask it to do whatever I want. And it's, it's different than reading a book because the book has stock things, you know, and knowing that the bot is making a little story for me and can explain why it did this or why it did that or change the names to Chinese or Japanese or, you know, switch now, now, uh, now I'll put the same thing in English. Now I'll put the same thing in German. Um, you know, being able to do that with the chatbot feels different than doing it with a human because with a human, you don't want to be wasting their time. Um, and the chatbot has all the time in the world. And it's different than a book because it's live and interactive and all the little examples are just for you, not for, you know, kind of just a static population of everybody who reads the book. I can see this transforming bedtime for children. Yeah, including including there could easily be an iPad app that animates whatever story you have it in. Oh yeah. yeah, I have a friend who is trying to build these right now. In whatever in whatever mode or genre you would like. Right. Mm. It reminds oh, me a lot that. of yeah that context reminds me a lot of. But did you ever see there was um wow a Star Trek Voyager episode where the little girl has a holodeck story, um and she and it changes significantly based on some of her uh, inputs in ways that are unexpected. It uh, reminds me a lot I of that. I vaguely remember that. It's also a lot like uh, Neil Stevenson's... Uh, Diamond Age. Yeah, Diamond Age. A Young Ladies or, Illustrated Primer. Yep. Yeah, fun fact, then they they used to expose the, domain, the URL, but they don't anymore. The original Kindle um, notes URL included a reference to the Diamond yeah. Age. I remember yeah. that. That's fun. GenTube, good idea. There's your startup. Blanton, there you go. <laughs> right. <clears throat> it just will be very expensive right now, but probably two years. Yeah. 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 The stuff is and, just getting easier and easier to do. And the image generation stuff is going to get to be real time. So it's not even. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Facebook already has like a few, um, uh, the price of paper, right? On video generation. Right. Yeah. Uh, so licensing before frame to, uh, by frame. Uh, very expensive, but. You could imagine it being like a few years, yes. From an earlier uh, email, I went and looked at uh, a show that basically creates avatars called Alter Ego, that um, where it's just a sing-off where different singers present, except the singers are off stage wearing mocap stuff with a nice microphone wired in front of their face. They perform the heck out of things, but what the judges see is whatever avatar they've chosen to be represented as and then doing strange avatar stuff like you could levitate your avatar very easily right so that's being projected on stage i'll i'll put a, a post uh, to the original this is the first episode of alter ego which i ha hadn't heard of before that that's sort of I, a lower key version or uh, an easier to execute on version of uh the masked singer yes Yes, uh, and and yeah, with a lot more, a lot more flex on on what you're doing. It's interesting. I, I I don't know, but 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 take that, which is live mocap rendered as whatever avatar you want, marry it to the thing Pete was just describing, and drop that any place, and you're off and running. It's like mm -hmm. wow, okay. I'm we're not going to recognize our world in in twenty years. Interestingly enough, Stevenson's primer had mocapped actors that played the the parts of the you know the the storyteller wow and and that seemed fa the whole thing seemed, seemed fantastic at the time and now we're not going to need the the mocap it's right, right. really bizarre we can so just generate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in fact you could invent some new poly creature and then have it generate motion that seems natural for that creature and yeah. animate the thing. I mean, like, like, yeah. Well, once you're in that territory, you can you can create anything you want. Yep. Very interesting. All right, gentle friends. 
Uh, shall we now hold the call? call? Uh, yeah. Thank you so thank much. You. This is really, Thanks. really awesome. Thank you. Thank you, and have a nice week. Uh, Pete, yeah. if you want to send me the, the no, recording video. No, be careful to stop the recording before. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Uh, do stop it. Uh, but if you want to send me that recording, I will upload it as part two, because I'm right now uploading part one. Awesome. We'll do Thanks. It. Thank you so much.